guys. Welcome. Welcome to AppNexus. Thank you, Igor. Igor is always so nice. He always responds. Igor runs engineering. Um, so I'm Mike Millet, CTO, co-founder here at AppNexus. Super excited you guys are all here. Um, I don't know how many of you know, we're kicking off this series, Engineering at Scale, this year. Um, partially just to share some of our learnings to get other people in here. Um, obviously today we have Pete, I'll introduce him in a minute. Um, on February 27th, we actually have one of the co-founders of Right Media coming in, sitting down with Brian for a fireside chat. So we're super excited to have you guys here starting this conversation. Um, and yeah, so it was really great. Um, today, uh, Pete Emerson is gonna talk to us uh, a little bit about how we do global load balancing. Um, I remember this very, very well. Pete and I built this together actually over a weekend in the last minute. He's gonna tell a little bit more about why. Um, <laughs> it was a pretty crazy weekend. Uh, but Pete is actually, he was one of our first clients originally when we started AppNexus. We started the company as a cloud company um, and Pete was at a gaming company called Garage Games. Um, and we told him you should host with AppNexus and he did. Um, now our hosting business kind of changed and kind of sort of disappeared over the years. So instead we hired Pete and he became employee number 11. Uh, we are now just over 400, just to give you a sense. So he's one of our oldest alums. Um, been here over four and a half years. Um, he actually lives in Oregon, so he uh, is remote out of Eugene, but here frequently. Has been doing operations, sysadmin, and DevOps work for 12 plus years. At Right Media, he was running ops for the ad server team. So all of our very high QPS ad server scale, to scale at Right Media, um, he saw, did those pains, and really helped set up the infrastructure correctly here at AppNexus. Um, and last, but most importantly, he is the founder, chairman, and winner of the 2010 AppNexus Beard competition. Uh, he is one sexy man. All right, Pete, super excited to introduce Pete. Pete, coming up, and uh, yeah, let's give him a round of applause. Thanks, Mike. Enjoy. Thanks. Thank you all uh, very much. Uh, I shaved my face clean this morning. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Um, uh, so, first of all, a couple of thank yous um, to Jacob for all of your technical support in making this room as awesome as it is. That's uh, a wonderful space. And also uh, to Jessica. I don't see Jessica, but oh, here's, there she is. Uh, thank you also for all of your work in organizing these uh, events. It's really uh, fantastic uh, for you to do what you do. Thank you. Um, so, this is my youngest daughter. This is Bella. Um, Bella is almost two. She'll be two on, uh, on Sunday. And I got a call uh, today, this afternoon, and there's Bella on the phone. And she says, uh, my, my wife is pregnant with my, our fourth child, uh, due in July. Uh, Bella says, Mama, whoosh, 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 baby. Translation, she had been to the doctor with my wife and had heard the ultrasound going off. So, uh, Mike, the, the, the human scale portion of, of this talk is, is here. And that is to say that in 20, 25 years, I expect that there are four more uh, Emersons employed at AppNexus uh, helping us <laughs> scale uh, in, a, in a human way. My, the rest of my talk is all, all the technical scale, but I'm, I want you to know, Mike, that I'm solving the human scale uh, as well. So, <laughs> um, so a welcome to visitors. I'm guessing by the, the name tags that we've got more than half the people in the house are, are visitors, so welcome to you. Welcome to AppNexus. We're thrilled that you're here. Um, we're gonna do a, a Q&A at the end. We've got a microphone over, uh, over on this side. It may or may not be, need to be switched on, so just first person check that um, at, at the end. Um, and then after the talk, I'm happy to hang out and uh, answer any more questions, talk related or not. Uh, I'll, I'll be around for a while and we'd love to meet, meet you and, and get to know you a little bit. So AppNexus 1.0, as, as Mike said, we started uh, 
AppNexus started out as a cloud computing uh, company. So this meant a suite of tools uh, similar to Amazon EC2 in a way uh, that allows us to uh, reserve servers, slice those servers up into virtual servers, um, connect them to load balancers, uh, do D DNS and uh, GSLB manipulations, um, the standard suite of, of tools. Um, we started out offering just virtualized instances, so we were running Zen Hypervisor on every box, and then the, the customer would reserve a, a whole server, not partitioning a server up between customers, but an entire server per customer, and then letting them slice them up um, as, they, as they so choose. Um, we then, later on, um, after AppNexus became 2.0 and went into the advertising side of the business, we then increased that offering so that we now allow our customers, of which we are the biggest client, um, the, the ability to launch bare metal servers uh, as well. So we strip out that hypervisor and, and let, them, uh, let them go bare metal. So just a, a brief explanation of, of where we are today. Um, so imagine that you're, uh, you're browsing a website and our uh, tag, our ad tag is on the page. Uh, so you're on CNN and, and you're making a request to our ad servers. Here's essentially what happens. Um, so the request comes in to us and we then send out information to bidders. Most of those bidders are in-house bidders, but we do have some third-party uh, bidders as well. They're cloud customers. Uh, we need that low latency uh, connection, much like the high frequency trading area. Latency is critical here. Um, and then the, the bids come back and we collect the bids, collect the results, and then ship out the ad, and we log that into our data pipeline. Uh, we take our, our cut in the middle, send out the, the winning bid, and, and show the ad back to the customer. Um, and all of this it has to happen in under 100 milliseconds. So it's really fast, and a lot of them. I'll talk a little bit about how, how big that scale is uh, in a little bit. This is a, a simplistic explanation, of course. Uh, the reality is, if you look at the advertising landscape, and, and this uh, slide is a little bit outdated, um, that the advertising world is enormous and complicated. Uh, you've got DSPs and SSPs and all sorts of acronyms that I don't even know what they are. Um, and then you can see uh, between the, the DSPs and the exchanges at Nexus, we get our own little box in the middle because at the time, uh, everyone was trying to define us and figure out where we stood and weren't exactly able to do it. So we got our own, uh, own little world there. Okay, so let me jump to the end result. Um, so load balancers, we're ripping them out and uh, so here, here's a graph of, of our load balancer traffic. And December 6, we're in panic mode. Uh, and Mike and I are uh, coming up with a, a solution to ditch our load balancers completely. They're running hot. Um, and then you can see uh, we, we rolled this out uh, over to half of our servers, roughly, uh, cut, cut down that traffic. Uh, tremendously and then bit the bullet and then dropped our, our, our load balancer traffic down to so minimal it barely shows up on the, on the scale here. Okay, so why? Why would we want to get rid of our load balancers? Well, there, there are four main reasons. Um, one, of course, is cost. When you're doing things at the scale that we do things at, load balancers are really expensive. Um, and so um, we've got provisioning time, which is a concern. Uh, if you need to order more load balancers, you can't just get next day shipping. It doesn't generally work that way. Uh, you've got to have a lead time, and you, so you've got your capacity planning model uh, that if something goes wrong with your model and you uh, all of a sudden are up against a brick wall, um, then you can get into a pickle. Um, 
We had some instances of vendor reliability as well. In particular, we got shipped uh, a pair of uh, load balancers that we were testing and they were mismatched load balancers. So one uh, load balancer had uh, not as much capacity as the other, which if you're looking at a failover situation, uh, master slave, you certainly don't want your slave to be uh, under provisioned. Um, we also had a, a situation that we were unable to figure out where we had a load balancer spontaneously rebooting. Um, when your uptime demands are incredibly high, having a critical piece of hardware like that uh, reboot and trying to track that down um, is, is difficult. So, uh, so we decided with these reasons that it's, it's time to get rid of them. Um, the last one, uh, the, the, the five times lower performance issue, um, the, uh, the, cons the problem there turned out to be that our traffic I is very small. We're just, we're sending very little data back and forth, but we're doing it a lot. And the, the load balancer was simply unable to, to keep up with the load and was t tanking out five times lower than, than we were hoping they would. So, Lots of great reasons to just get rid of your load balancers uh, entirely. So the original architecture shouldn't come as much surprise. Um, here's your load balancer, and we've got what we call an imp bus behind it, imp bus being short for impression bus. This is the first uh, response that is then holding the auction uh, and um, then collecting the results from the bidder and then shipping the ad. Uh, back out. Um, th this uh, applies to certainly third-party uh, uh, bidders as well. As I, as I mentioned before, most of our bidders are in-house, but it, that does mean that uh, due to latency concerns, everyone's got to be uh, in, our, in our cloud infrastructure. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, the first step of the process is to simply publish an IP address for each of the uh, imp buses in DNS. Um, we have a, a GSLB solution in place as well, uh, which gives us localization to a particular data center. Um, so that, that means if you're in New York, you're going to hit our New York data center. If you're in LA, you're going to hit our LA data center. Um, and uh, so, uh, simply publishing our, our DNS, uh, and I'll, hopefully this will be uh, big enough here so that you can see. Uh, so we can see here, Uh, so here we're getting one set of IP addresses. I'm, I'm on a jump box in LA, uh, and on the left, left hand side, I'm getting a totally, totally different set uh, of, of boxes. Um, okay, so there's our solution. Let's start there. Is that good enough? Well, the answer, easy answer is no, because it would make for a pretty short, boring talk. Um, so we've got some issues with this, obviously. And these three issues are, are um, variations of a theme. And that is, well, if you've published your IP addresses of your imp buses in DNS, then as soon as one of them goes down, then you've lost traffic. Um, so that means your code must be perfect. We strive for it. We're not perfect. Um, your code can never be improved. Well, that's obviously not going to happen. Uh, we do our releases almost on a daily basis. Um, and you lose one, you've lost a fraction of, of your uh, capacity, and even a tenth of a percent of, of our traffic down a black hole, uh, we're, we're going to hear about it and, and have problems with our customers. So D publishing IP address and DNS alone it doesn't doesn't cut it. So here's our solution for that piece of the puzzle. We're using an open source uh, tool called KeepAliveD to migrate our IPs around. So on our, on our servers, we have two sets of IPs. We have an internal IP that's just for our, uh, our use uh, within our own 
uh, VLANs. And then we've got a public-facing IP address, and that's the IP address that we then allow to float around uh, from machine to machine. Uh, it's uh, a, a piece of open source code, um, and we've, we slid that in. I'll show you a configuration file here. Um, so this is uh, up at the top here, these first four lines. This is the, the, uh, the script that is running to actually check the status of the imp bus. Are you doing OK or not, yes or no? Um, so below then, this particular uh, configuration file is assuming, is stating that it is the master IP, that it is the master for this particular IP address. It's got a priority of 150, and it, and it states the, uh, the, the track script down there. And then down below, it's listing a bunch of other IP addresses that it is willing to serve as the master for. So in case of master failure from another IP address, then it will, um, it will potentially become the new master. So in this particular case, the .70 address, it's willing to, at a priority level of 140, willing to take that IP address on uh, .169, has a priority of 110, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to attempt to do what one is normally not recommended to do during uh, a, a presentation, that is do a live demo. Um, I'm, I'm in a, our sand environment, and we, I should be able to see that uh, I have over on, on the right-hand screen, I have my, my imp bus 08.bm imp bus sand08.lax1. Uh, so just to break that down a little bit, it's the eighth impression bus. It, the BM states that it's a bare metal machine. It's the Sand08 environment, uh, and it's in our LA data center. Uh, so this machine uh, responds to an HTTP request slash status, and it says, all right, I'm, I'm ready one. I'm in a good place. Um, and on the left, I'm going to simply tail the, um, uh, tail the Varlog messages. And then I'm going to uh, kill the imp bus. And what we should see on the left is that we should see keep alive kick in and say, uh, hey, I'm, I'm taking over this IP address. There we go. Hey, success. All right, so you can see it says entering master state. And so it's taken over this 68.67.151.70 uh, IP address. Um, and, uh, and so now if I simply start this back up again, I, I should see the reverse. And I'll just let that go because it, it's a reasonably lengthy uh, process that I don't need to see. In one direction is good enough. Okay, so now we have the ability to send our traffic to another box. And uh, uh, so, so now inbox, inbox box A dies, traffic gets sent over to inbox box B. Fantastic, all right. Is that good enough? Well, no, it's not. We've solved this first problem. We've gotten rid of the redundancy, the, uh, uh, the imp bus being down problem because now traffic goes over somewhere else. That's good, but we've still got another problem. Now you've got twice as much traffic going to that second box. So we need to deal with this one as well. So we have written our own DNS servers um, and we've got a, uh, a DNS domain called gslb.com that we serve all of our DNS traffic out of. Um, and what this, DN what this uh, DNS server allows us to do is take traffic in and out based on the, st the status of an application. So, the vast majority of our applications here will respond to an HTTP request, and in particular will return, will respond to the slash status uh, request. And I think we saw that uh, here. 
uh, at the top here. You can see the result of the status request. And it contains interesting information like the current version number, um, the, the host name of, of the box that it's serving on, startup time, that sort of thing. So our DNS server then can query and say, hey, what's your status? And if this, the reply comes back ready one, then everything's great. But if the reply doesn't come back as ready one, either it says ready zero or it gets no reply after a certain period of time, uh, then it will yank that imp bus out of DNS completely. Then the end result is that traffic gets rebalanced after a period of time among all of the remaining imp buses. So here's a, a graph of, of that happening. Uh, I did a, a trial uh, in production. And uh, so the green line on the left uh, is the CPU usage of the box that I killed. And so you can see that skyrocketing up towards uh, com being completely idle at 100%. Um, and on the left, you see a bit of a dip there, uh, right before the 1435 mark. Um, and then uh, the, the traffic usage then goes up. There's a dip at 1445. Not really sure what's going on there. Um, but the end result is uh, that there's, there is a, a brief dip in, C, or a brief increase in CPU usage, but that goes away really quite quickly. So with our DNS entries, uh, we have a, a TTL of 30 seconds. And if you're a good um, DNS uh, server, you're, you're, you are um, obeying that request. Not everybody is, you're not required to, but most people seem to. Um, and be because of the volume of traffic that we're doing, um, when we're doing a, something on the order of 17 plus thousand DNS requests a second, um, then we see that traffic then rebalancing uh, across our remaining servers quite quickly. Okay, so our current architecture then involves DNS with GSLB and the response back from the DNS server gives us a pool of IP addresses to look up. The pool of IP addresses can fail over to each other. Those IP addresses can be ripped out of DNS. And there we go. We've got our, our solution. And it works pretty well, particularly since we did it over the course of a weekend. <laughs> and it's still in production today. So I'm very, very pleased with, with that result. Now, is everything perfect? Well, no, of course not. Um, so there are some takeaways here that are, that are worth thinking about if you're thinking about perhaps ripping out your architecture. Um, one of them is SSL traffic. So our load balancers uh, um, will decrypt SSL. You upload the, the certificate uh, chain into uh, the load balancer, and it will decrypt the traffic, pass it along to the imp buses, and, and uh, deal, with, deal with all of that. So with no load balancer, obviously no SSL. For, for a while, we were running uh, all of our encrypted traffic through the load balancers, and our unencrypted was going direct to the imp bus. Uh, and then we switched to an S-Tunnel Nginx solution uh, to actually get SSL traffic on, on the imp buses themselves. DNS, our DNS implementation does not give us anything beyond um, straightforward round robin. So if you are interested in uh, different load balancing techniques, such as uh, least used CPU, that sort of thing, uh, then our architecture doesn't, doesn't support that. Um, I think up, that's a pretty minor, uh, minor thing to, to beef about. Commercial support, of course, uh, with, with our load balancers, for better or for worse, you've got support if you've got problems. Uh, with, with Keep Alive D, um, it's, it's open source, so yes, you can dig into the code, um, but you can't pay anyone uh, money to, to fix it if there's a root problem uh, with the code. Pluses and minuses there. Um, DNS drain. 
so once we've taken that IP address out of DNS, there is a period of time uh, which uh, um, that servers will still be making requests to that old IP, even though um, we've taken it out of DNS because they've got a, a stale DNS cache. Um, what we've seen in our testings is that for us, at the, at the volume that we're, we're at, um, we don't lose a lot of, of traffic because of that. Um, and finally, uh, the Keep Alive uh, software does use multicast for its communications. And the last I heard, Amazon EC2, if you're in that, uh, in that system, didn't support multicast at all. Um, so obviously, Keep Alive D doesn't work for you. Um, the bullet point there is that as of December 12th of this past year, uh, their uh, Route 53 uh, offering does do a similar uh, feature to our DNS servers in that it will do uh, on your behalf TCP checks uh, or uh, HTTP checks in a, in a similar fashion. So there, there is a way to do it uh, with the EC2 cloud, just not exactly with our, our solution. Okay, so to to start wrapping this up, let's look at some numbers. So this is where we are today. Um, in particular, uh, related to everything I've just talked about, the, the number there uh, that is interesting is the 40 billion ad impressions processed per day. To put that in some perspective, oh, and, and that's, uh, you know, if, you, if you did that linearly, you'd be talking about 400, over 450,000 uh, requests per second, uh, but our traffic isn't linear, it's very cyclical, of course, um, and so at our peak, then, we're talking about a million queries per second that's, that are coming into our impulses. Um, and to put those numbers in perspective, that's approximately 6.2 ads per person for every person on the planet. Or if you want to knock that down and say, well, how about people who have internet access? Uh, that's more like 17.8 ads that we're serving per person that has internet access on the planet. It's a lot of, a lot of traffic. Uh, 17,000 plus DNS queries per second uh, coming into our, our custom, custom solution. Um, and obviously the, the plug is that we're hiring. Um, I love this place a lot and I'm happy to, to talk with any of you about AppNexus and why uh, I love it, but it's a great family, it's a, it's, a, it's a good place to be. So, with that, I will entertain questions. Hi, uh, I'm not gonna ask a technical question basically because I'm not qualified, but um, early on you had a CNN slide where CNN requested uh, something and you sent things back. Sure, let me pull that up for you so we can yeah, it would make it a little see easier. that all together. So I understand the, the, the advertisers are primarily clients of AppNexus. How do you procure the space on the CNN page? Do you buy it forward? Are they also a client? So our, the, the customers that we are working with um, I don't believe that we're working with any publishers directly ourselves, but our customers are working with publishers. Um, and so our customers are the, are the ones working with uh, the publishers to then ultimately get our ad tag uh, on their site. Okay, th thank you, that's very interesting. Okay. It was a great talk, thanks a lot. I, I understood about half of it, which is pretty good. All right. <laughs> On this slide, actually, you mentioned that you want response in under 100 milliseconds. Yeah. Yet in your demo, it took maybe 15 seconds for Keep Alive D to kick in? Uh, for, for Keep Alive D to take over the IP address, it, t it took a while. It was not under 100 milliseconds. This is true. Yeah. So is that kind of acceptable timing for you? Uh, for us, it's acceptable timing, yeah. And is that, like, what's the, how often does Keep Alive D ping the master? So Keep Alive D is going to uh, uh, kick in whenever we do an upgrade, because our, our methodology there uh, is to, uh, to basically take a, a subset of our servers down 
upgrade them, throw them back into place. Um, so that is happening, but when it's in a, um, when you're in that controlled phase, actually what we can do is uh, set the server that we want to take down into ready zero mode. Um, and, uh, but we'll keep serving ads, even though it's in ready zero, which means don't serve any more ads. If any requests do come in, then we'll still serve it. Then keep alive D kicks in, flips the IP address over to the other server, and then we're okay. So in the upgrade scenario, it's a lot better than, than the crash scenario. Well, but what about crash scenario? Like so then in the crash scenario case, then you're looking at that, um, in this example, it was 15 seconds, if you say. Um, then that's the repercussions. Yeah. Um, another question regarding your GSLB. Mm -hmm. How accurate do you find that it works for you? As in, like, do you get California IPs in New York? Uh, I'm not sure how, to, how we've quantified that. I'm not sure. Uh, we do uh, localization in a couple of different ways. Uh, the one is the um, well, one is the name server resolution, and then the other is in the uh, in the imp bus itself is doing a, using a GOIP um, from MaxMind uh, table in order to then do location targeting based on the IP address. So there are two different uses, but um, I. I don't know the answer to your question about how accurate the, the localization really is. So, so, so like again, if somebody is coming in from California to New York, it's already maybe like 60, 70 milliseconds round that's, trip plus right. your processing. Yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly latency that is out of our control. Um, but to, to solve that, then we uh, look at putting more data centers in maybe Chicago or Texas, or you know, we have no, um, uh, no presence whatsoever in Asia at all. Uh, so that, those uh, ad requests are currently hitting LA probably. Um, so we're eventually global domination, so, so we'll, we'll get there, we'll be putting uh, data centers there as well. So you, you don't have any comment like how accurate your GSLB solution versus commercial vendors? Uh, I don't, no. Thank you. Um, well, you guys could consider uh, BGP Anycast or something like that for the load balancing, but um, question, have you run into any limits with the number of A records you can return for your DNS? Because that seems like that limits the number of impulses you could have. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that not too long ago myself. Um, I don't. So when you do, if let me let me go back to that, uh, back to my shell, so I can. Because uh, you only have like what five hundred twelve something like that in a DNS response. Yeah. So if I dig ib.adnexus.com. So even there, I'm, I'm only getting 10 of them, right? Three, six, eight, eight of them or so. Um, so our software is then round robining that on every request. So you can see this, this one's different. And so, yeah, so that's how we're doing that. We're just cycling through and giving a different list to every request. And do you, do you possibly list the same IP twice or something if you have a server with more capacity than the others? Because you don't have weight or balance or, I mean, weight or priorities. We certainly could play that game. So if you had, uh, if you were willing to send twice as much traffic to, uh, to a particular server or, you know, you get the next generation of processor and they're so far beyond the previous generation that you want to start sending more traffic that way, we could certainly start playing those games. Yeah. And just last question, so you mentioned you rolled your own DNS server. Do you use like Perl libraries, PHP libraries, or do you guys actually, you know, write some C code and build a DNS resolver? I think our server? DNS server is all written in Perl, but don't hold me to that. Igor, do you happen to know on that one? I think it's all Perl. No way. Well, yeah. Thank you. Sure. How long did it take to uh, configure the Keep Alive D? Is that like a pretty lightweight process, like getting that set up? Was that what you did in a weekend? 
for actual configuration of the file itself. Yeah, just like getting it like up and running, like if you want to like get into like a sandbox environment and test it out and set it up. Oh, oh. Uh, so if you want to play with Keep Alive D, what what's the pain threshold? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like for sure. example, using Graphite. When we tried to get when we set up Graphite, you know, there was a whole lot of like just package installation and annoyance. Yeah. The, so I was involved in the, in our Graphite. Uh, installation here early on um, and for those of you who don't know graphite is a, a graphing tool so we we ship all of our metrics in uh, to graphite to then uh, pull out amazing graphs both on an instance level and then on a clustered view uh, we're pulling in something like two million metrics every minute into our system it's phenomenal but I agree with you about the the installation process is pretty hairy yeah um, uh, as far as keep alive D, it, it's really simple. It's a binary and a configuration file um, to, to get it up and running. So playing with it, um, you could just throw it on a, on a virtual box on your Mac and, and have it up and running pretty quickly. Um, as far as the configuration of, of these files go, we're using, uh, we're using Puppet. So these files are um, generated with a, with a uh, configuration file that has some uh, Ruby in it that does the looping over an array and then generates uh, each of the master and, and slave portions of the file. So all of that gets auto-generated for us. Uh, so that's how we, we do the configuration management portion. So one of the questions, so I'm not a sysengg, I'm a developer, but like, you know, if the load balancer goes out like Rackspace because they don't configure something right, which, which has happened, you know, we, we feel the pain. So I'm, I'm curious to like, with rolling your own DNS server, like how long that took? Was that what you did in a weekend? Because I'm just trying to bring this uh, back no, to our company. No, so the, D <laughs> the DNS server was, was, already, uh, was already in place. Um, uh, that was not the weekend project. The weekend project was, doing, it was uh, getting Keep Alive D up and running and deploying that uh, consistently, so wrapping that into our automated deployment system. Um, and, and then a whole lot of, of testing uh, to make sure that it was doing the right thing. Um, and, and just doing the architecture work up front. Was, the DNS server was already in place. Um, I think that there are some other, th there are some third party DNS servers that may do this sort of thing. So you wouldn't necessarily have to roll your own uh, in order to get that going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to hang out afterwards. Come up and introduce yourselves. Love to, love to meet you. Thank you all.